Okay, well, <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you everyone um, for joining us uh, this evening. Um, my name is Jonathan Kaufman. I'm a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter. Um, I've written and reported on China for 30 years um, for the Boston Globe, where I covered the Tiananmen massacre back in 1989, um, for the Wall Street Journal, where I served as China bureau chief from 2002 to 2005, uh, and for Bloomberg News. Um, I've written a number of books, including A Hole in the Heart of the World, Being Jewish in Eastern Europe, um, and Broken Alliance, The Turbulent Times Between Blacks and Jews in America, which won the National Jewish Book Award. Um, I'm currently the director of the School of Journalism at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking about my book, The Last Kings of Shanghai, um, which describes the really remarkable odyssey of two families, two Jewish families originally from Baghdad, um, who made their fortune in China and really stood astride Chinese business and politics um, for more than 175 years, uh, really up to today. Um, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable story that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. And I'm glad that I'm sharing it with such an international audience because the book is being translated and published in a number of countries um, over the next uh, 12 months, uh, including Israel and, um, and China. So um, I, I enjoy the opportunity to kind of bring this, bring this story to you all. Um, I thought I would start out by talking a little bit about how I got interested um, in this topic. Um, as I say, I was a foreign correspondent for many years covering China. And my first trip to China was back in the late 1970s. Now this is a time when China was still red China. Um, everybody was wearing those blue Mao suits. Um, there were far more bicycles than cars. Uh, Mao, uh, Chairman Mao had died only a few years before. And I was in Shanghai doing some reporting and I was walking along the Bun, that famous uh, Art Deco um, strip of buildings uh, that are right on the waterfront and I had to use the bathroom. So I stepped into a hotel and it was like stepping into a 1930s movie set. Um, the floors were marble, uh, there were Lily crystal uh, windows everywhere, chandeliers hanging from the ceiling and a, a bellhop dressed all in white with a little white cap came up to me. And when I asked him in English where the bathroom was, he responded to me in French. Um, I left there trying to figure out what this artifact was doing, this throwback to the 1930s was doing in the middle of red China. And someone told me that it had been the Cafe Hotel um, built by a Jewish playboy millionaire, Victor Sassoon. It had once been the grandest hotel in the East. Um, and Victor Sassoon had been one of the wealthiest, um, the wealthiest men uh, in Shanghai. So as you do often when you're a reporter, I kind of filed that away and, and sort of went on to my, <clears throat> my other stories. A few years later, I was back in Shanghai again, and um, uh, someone in the Chinese foreign ministry suggested that I go visit what he called the Children's Palace. Um, this was a place, he said, where Chinese parents brought their kids on weekends and uh, had ballet lessons, violin lessons, things like that. So I thought, sure, <clears throat> it'll be a, a fun little feature story. And um, so he, this, he took me there, and this children's palace looked like it was a, a building out of Downton Abbey. It looked like an English country house. Again, right in the middle of Shanghai, surrounded by these beautiful grounds. Um, I went upstairs into the house, and indeed it was a, a place where all these Chinese children were getting music lessons, but it had clearly once been the house of an incredibly wealthy European family. Um, there was a ballroom that was more than 100 yards long. There were sweeping staircases that led up um, to bedrooms on the second floor. Um, and as I was leaving, I noticed a small plaque um, at the entrance to the house, which said this had once been the home of the Kaduri family. Well, I knew the Kaduri name because I was based in Hong Kong at the time, and the Kaduris were one of the wealthiest families uh, in Hong Kong, they were a very prominent Jewish family. Um, but I hadn't realized that they had spent the 20s and 30s, and it turned out much before, uh, living in Shanghai in this massive mansion. So again, I tucked that away. And then uh, when I was based in Beijing, my wife and I were living in Beijing, work, I was working for the Wall Street Journal, and uh, our three little kids were with us, and they always loved visiting Shanghai. 
they loved exploring it. It was just a big adventure for them. And so one uh, weekend when we were in Shanghai, we went traveling into sort of a poor neighborhood in the north of the city. And as we walked up and down these alleyways that were teeming with, with Chinese people, I noticed that there were the shadows of mezuzahs on many of the doorposts, not mezuzahs themselves, but sort of the outlines of them and the nail holes that had once, that had once held them um, against the door frames. And again, I found myself wondering what were mezuzahs doing in the middle of Shanghai? And of course, as it turned out, as I discovered, these were the uh, mezuzahs put there by some of the 18,000 refugees um, who had fled the Nazis in Berlin and Vienna and had found refuge in Shanghai during World War II. So all these things were kind of rattling around in my mind as I was a foreign correspondent in China. And I decided it was time to sort of find out what, what exactly was the history here, what was going on. Now, I think for most Americans, um, we're very familiar with the Ashkenazi history um, of the Jewish people, um, whether it's Fiddler on the Roof or our own family stories uh, of coming from Russia or Eastern Europe. Um, but this story took me in a different direction. It took me to Baghdad. Um, and it was a story that I think I was very unaware of, and, and certainly many American Jews are, are unaware of. Um, the Sassoons and the Kaduris uh, were Baghdadi Jews. And the Baghdadi Jews, of course, we first read about in the Bible. Um, these are the Jews who are kidnapped um, uh, after the destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar uh, and brought to Babylon, which is Baghdad. Baghdad is Babylon. And we read about them in the Bible when, uh, <clears throat> when it's written that by the waters of Babylon, they wept when they remembered Zion. But in fact, the Jews in uh, Babylon, in Baghdad, uh, did extremely well. Um, they quickly became very successful in business um, and in commerce. They established trading routes throughout the Middle East. And they were so prosperous and so influential that the various rulers of Baghdad over the years, whether it was the, the Turks, the Ottomans, others, uh, would turn to the Jewish community um, for economic advice. And they would choose one member, one family to be the leading family um, of the Jewish community. And um, whenever this person was brought to meet the king to advise him, he would be carried through the streets of, of Baghdad um, on, a, on a sedan chair. And everyone in Baghdad, Jew or Gentile, would dip their head in respect um, as he passed by. Uh, this family uh, was the Sassoon family. Um, the Sassoons were the wealthiest family in Baghdad, um, and they were considered uh, primary advisors uh, to the king on economic matters, sort of like the Minister of Finance or the American Secretary of the Treasury. Um, but as often happens in, um, in Jewish history, uh, the politics turned against the Jews in Baghdad um, by the early uh, 19th century in the 1800s. And uh, this is where my story really begins. Um, David Sassoon was the head of the Sassoon family and was about to take over leadership of this great dynasty, this great empire. Um, he was 37 years old, um, but he was kidnapped um, by the Turkish government and was being held for ransom uh, in, uh, in, in the jail. His father rushed down to ransom him and realized that things were not going to get better for the Jews, that, that it, was, it was really going to become too dangerous, especially for wealthy Jewish families like the Sassoons. So David Sassoon's father ransomed him out of prison, um, hustled him down to the waterfront, uh, put him on a, a ship um, that was going to sail him away from, from Baghdad. Um, but before he put him on the ship, he draped his son David in a cloak. And inside that cloak were um, sewn pearls and other precious gems that David Sassoon would be able to use to start his, his new life. Um, so in some ways, I, I think this story is not really like the familiar story, say, of a Fiddler on the Roof. It's almost Shakespearean. It's the story of a family, the Sassoon family, um, that had enormous wealth and influence, had it all taken away, and spent the next 200 years trying to trying to get it back, trying to reclaim um, the, uh, the authority and the wealth and the influence that they had. Um, David Sassoon made his way to India uh, and he arrived in India uh, in the 1820s, 1830s, just as Britain was arriving as well. And um, the British were determined to make India a colony. 
Um, but one of the things that they needed to spread their influence, not only in India, but throughout Asia, was they needed kind of merchants who would allow them to extend their economic influence. And so David Sassoon um, was a very smart businessman and quickly began uh, working with the British, um, setting up factories, getting involved in all sorts of uh, industries, including fabrics and, and others, um, and was quickly a millionaire. He was able to bring his family out of Baghdad and set them up safely in Bombay. He also became an Anglophile. Um, he decided that Britain at this point was the most powerful country in the world, and he was correct. And he was determined that his children would benefit by an alliance with the English. So David Sassoon had eight sons, and he made sure that all of them learned English, that all of them learned British history. And even though he himself never, never learned English, um, he uh, became a British citizen, and when Queen Victoria ascended the throne, uh, he stood on the banks uh, of the river in Bombay with his sons, still dressed in traditional Arab dress, and they sang God Save the Queen and um, swore their loyalty to the British Empire. Now, a key part of the British Empire um, was the, the, the sale and the trade of opium. Um, China at this point was still closed to Western trade. Uh, only a few cities were open for Western trade and the Chinese regulated it um, very heavily. And one of the reasons for doing that was that there was a huge business in smuggling opium into China. Um, opium was grown in India um, and it was then smuggled into China where more than 12% of Chinese citizens were addicted to opium by the 1820s, 1830s. I mean, just to give you a sense of, of how serious a problem this, uh, this was, um, in the United States and, and in Europe, we talk a lot about the opioid epidemic and the Sackler family that's been very involved in, in selling uh, these opioids that people have become addicted to and, and there's been a great deal of suffering. Um, probably about 2% of Americans are addicted to opioids or even illegal drugs like heroin. In China at this point, it was 12%. It was really crippling uh, China's ability to modernize. And so the Chinese empire was determined um, to keep out foreigners, to keep out foreign businesses, and especially to keep out opium. Um, but in the 1830s and 1840s, there were two wars called the Opium Wars, um, which were fought by Britain uh, to open up the Chinese market. Uh, China was defeated in these wars, um, and as a result, um, uh, British companies were given free reign along later with French companies, Americans, and others to trade with China. And so the Sassoons, David Sassoon, the patriarch, saw there was an enormous opportunity in the opium trade. The profits selling opium were immense, and the Sassoons dived into it. Um, and in many ways, they were incredibly entrepreneurial uh, and innovative. Um, two of the key things they did really took advantage of the technology of the time to make them the dominant players in the opium trade. Um, they started buying steamships. Opium typically was grown in India and then shipped to Hong Kong or Shanghai or, or any of the cities along the China coast. Um, and uh, sailing ships would take several weeks to make the journey. The Sassoons began buying steamships, which allowed them to get their opium um, to China much faster than their other British rivals. They were also early investors in the telegraph. Um, and what the telegraph did was it allowed the Sassoons to stay in close touch. David Sassoon took his eight sons and dispersed them all across China. And they would stay in touch with each other and with their father back in India, using the telegraph to determine when opium prices were high, when they were low, when was a good time to sell, what was the competition doing. They were so effective at the way in which they turned opium into a business that by 1870 or so, they had essentially driven everyone out of the opium business and they controlled the opium trade <coughs> completely. Um, and this was something that many of their British rivals were, were furious about. And in fact, when I was able to see the, uh, the research, uh, the papers um, of some of their rivals like Jardine Matheson and others, they're talking about, you know, who are these hook-nosed Jews? Who are these Jew boys who have come from Baghdad and are taking our profits and are able to take, uh, uh, make such a success um, of, the, of the opium trade? Um, 
I, I guess I, I do need to talk a little bit about the morality of all this, because clearly um, the fact that the Sassoons made so much money in opium um, is something that, uh, that is controversial. Um, the Chinese, when the Chinese communists conquered Shanghai, um, they were able to seize the Sassoon business records. And I was able to see them as well. And the Chinese concluded that the Sassoons made about a billion dollars, that's B for billion, um, from the opium trade, and then turned that into uh, huge investments in factories and, and in other uh, real estate and in other, in other investments. Um, and when I talked to the Sassoons um, for this book, um, uh, today, um, their attitude is sort of similar to people who made their money in alcohol or in cigarettes. Um, they say that, you know, opium was legal at the time, and that's true. Um, opium, growing of opium was legal in India. It was taxed by the British government. Uh, and in fact, it was used in Europe. Uh, aspirin wasn't widely used in Europe at this time. And so people would use uh, a, a diluted form of opium to, to reveal head to uh, relieve themselves of headaches and, and things like that. And in fact, the Sassoons also used their profits in opium uh, to sort of woo the British aristocracy. Uh, the, uh, David Sassoon realized that a key part of business um, in the 19th century was establishing a base in London. And so he would send his children, his sons over to London um, where they would put their children in, in uh, British public schools like Eton. They'd go to Cambridge University. Um, they would hold these lavish parties where they would invite the British aristocracy. And as part of this, the Sassoons gave the Prince of Wales and others an opportunity to invest in the opium business and to make money on it when they bought opium in India and then would sell it um, in China. Um, but the reality is uh, the, the Sassoons knew how dangerous opium was. They would always tell me that, well, it was a vice and it was like alcohol, it was like cigarettes. We were just filling a business need. But the, none of the Sassoons themselves ever used opium. And in fact, when you go through their business records, time and again, you see them struggling with Chinese workers who are becoming addicted to opium and can no longer function and can no longer work. And in the US and in Britain at this time, there was a big move against the opium trade, uh, driven largely by um, Protestant um, ministers and, and groups opposed to the opium trade. Um, so the Sassoons knew how dangerous opium was, but they were very much creatures of their time. Um, they were Jewish, but they were also imperialists. They were colonialists. They were part of the great British expansion um, through India and through China. And, um, you know, I think it's Balzac who once said, behind every great fortune, there's a crime. And in the Sassoon's case, the crime, the crime was, was opium. Um, I want to take a minute now to talk a little bit about the women in this history, because the story of women, in, especially in history in the 19th century and the early 20th century, is largely lost because you know, women, you know, they were not giving speeches. Um, they didn't, they weren't prominent in business. Yet behind the scenes, the women uh, in these families were really extraordinary. Um, as I mentioned, uh, one of the ways David Sassoon decided to expand his empire from India and China was to send his sons to England, to London, uh, where they would buy beautiful country houses and manage to expand the Sassoon influence by giving lavish parties and, and so forth. But that meant there were fewer and fewer members of the family in India and China to actually run the business. And in the late 1890s, um, the youngest Sassoon, who was still in India, died unexpectedly. And this was a crisis for the family. They didn't know who was going to run the business uh, now that he was dead. So his wife, a woman named Flora Sassoon, uh, stepped up and said that she would run the business um, as a regent um, until their son, who was a teenager at the time, uh, came of age and was able to, um, able to uh, take, things, uh, take things over. So her brothers-in-law, all of whom were in London, um, decided that was a fine idea. After all, she was just a woman and you know, she would be a good caretaker until the male line of succession uh, could resume. Um, but it turned out Flora Sassoon was an extraordinary businesswoman. She spoke several languages and had an incredible head for business. 
Now she took over the company in Bombay at a time when not only women couldn't vote, um, women were actually prevented from appearing in public. They lived behind um, Perda, um, uh, which uh, basically restricted women to their home. So Flora Sassoon began running this global empire from her living room. But over time, she did begin to go to the Sassoon offices and created a minor scandal when she would appear in public. And then in a situation <clears throat> much like we're living through now, a pandemic broke out in Bombay, a bubonic plague. And as a result of this plague, uh, many of the Sassoon workers, Indians who work for the Sassoons, were terrified about coming to work. They wouldn't come to work. Factories were having to close down. It was a crisis for the Sassoon family. Well, Flora Sassoon decided to bring over scientists from Europe to find a vaccine, and they succeeded. And then to convince her workers that the vaccine was safe, Flora Sassoon <laughs> insisted that she be given the Sassoon and that a photograph be taken of her with her bare arm, um, that she be given a shot of the vaccine so all her workers would see that this was safe. Um, uh, her strategy worked. Um, the vaccine was, was widely used and the Sassoon fortune was saved. But her brothers-in-law in London started to get nervous. Clearly this was not just a, a woman who would be a puppet and would be a caretaker. She clearly had a mind of her own and was very smart about how to run this business. And so her brothers-in-law in London got together and essentially staged a, a boardroom coup um, where they uh, uh, kicked her out of the business um, she eventually made her way to London and became a very well-known philanthropist and scholar, um, but she never set foot in the Sassoon businesses again. As a, a friend of mine said, she hit the bamboo ceiling and was not able to rise any further. Um, another, uh, another woman I want to talk about is Laura Kaduri. So the other family I write about in this book is the Kaduri family. Um, now the Sassoons, they were expanding throughout China. And one of the challenges they faced was who's going to run all these offices in China that were stretching up and down the coast. And so they sent word back to Baghdad um, that Jewish families <clears throat> who were worried um, about their children or wanted to find a way to make extra money could send their children uh, to India to work for the Sassoons. And the Sassoons set up schools where they would educate these children. They set up hospitals where they would be taken care of, Jewish hospitals. They set up synagogues. Um, and they even set up Jewish cemeteries in China and in India. So if these uh, Jewish workers uh, became ill and died, they would get a Jewish burial. Um, and so over the years, um, many Jewish families in Baghdad began to send their children to work for the Sassoons, knowing that they would be taken care of, essentially cradle to grave in this far off place known as China. So the Kaduri family um, had fallen on hard times. Um, they were distantly related to the Sassoons, uh, but their father had died. Um, and their mother was, um, had seven children. And so she decided to send several of her boys to work for the Sassoons, one of whom was Eli Kaduri. Eli was only 14 years old when he left Baghdad uh, and made his way to Bombay. And he was 18 years old when he was shipped to China to work for the Sassoons in a small port north of Shanghai. And I just try to imagine, you know, what it must have been like for this 14-year-old and this 18-year-old um, to, to, to land in China. He doesn't speak any Chinese. Um, and he begins to work for the Sassoons in trade. <clears throat> One of the things Eli Kaduri recognizes early on is that he can make a lot of money in China. Uh, China was like the Wild West, like Silicon Valley, kind of choose your metaphor. It was a place where men, and they were almost always men, could make a great deal of money very quickly. So Eli Kaduri actually leaves the Sassoons um, and makes his way to Hong Kong and begins to amass investments. Um, because he's Jewish, he's actually excluded from many of the British old boy clubs and, and British businesses. So he's forced to be more creative. He ends up working with Chinese partners and with other immigrants um, who are in Hong Kong and amasses a, a quite a substantial portfolio of businesses, including an electric company and hotels. Um, and as he turns 30, it becomes time for him to seek a wife. And so he does what every um, aspiring uh, 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 influential businessman does. He goes to England to try to find someone to marry. There he meets a woman named Laura Makata, 
She's a member of what would be considered the Jewish aristocracy in Britain. Her family was very prominent. Uh, she and Ellie fall in love and they decide to get married. Um, now, typically at that point, what would have happened, um, this is around the late 1890s, is that Ellie would have gone back to China. Um, Laura would have gotten pregnant, so Ellie would go back to China and come back home to visit Laura and his children maybe a couple of times a year. But Laura Kaduri was an extraordinary woman. She was very independent. She was actually older than Ellie and her family was worried that she might uh, die a spinster because she was so independent minded and, and had such a spirit about her. Um, and she announces after the wedding that she's gonna accompany uh, Ellie Kaduri back to China. She's not gonna just stay uh, in London and wait for him. So the two of them board a ship, make their way back to Hong Kong. Um, Laura quickly has two uh, small children. And uh, in a, an even more extraordinary moment, she announces that she's going to accompany her husband, Ellie, as he travels across China doing his business deals. And so she packs up her two children, several servants, all their luggage, and begins to travel with him by steamer and by rickshaw and, and you know, by wagons um, all throughout China. Um, and she really gets an incredibly Glim, an incredible glimpse of what life in China is really like. Um, for my purposes, what's wonderful is that she keeps a diary um, of all these trips. And one of the things that comes through is that while Ellie, her husband is off doing business deals, she is seeing the poverty, the civil war, the terrible devastation that ordinary Chinese are living through um, in the early 1900s. Um, and one of the things she concludes is that the problem in China is that girls are not being educated. Now, remember, this is in like early, the early 1900s. No one is really thinking this way. Um, and uh, Laura decides that the solution to improving life in China is to build schools just for girls. So she persuades her husband um, to start funding schools for girls uh, in several cities in China, and even back in Baghdad, where the family had originally come from. And um, she gets very involved in this philanthropy work. And it makes a huge difference for these Chinese girls to get educated. Um, they eventually settle in Shanghai, in a, in a, in a mansion in Shanghai. And um, one day there's a fire, a fire breaks out in this mansion. Laura Kaduri runs out. Um, but is convinced that the governess uh, who takes care of her children is still trapped inside this burning house. So she runs back in to try to rescue her. As it turned out, the governess had gotten out through a different door. Laura becomes disoriented in the smoke and in the flames and she collapses and she dies in the fire. This is obviously a tragedy for the Kaduri family, but it's also a story that the Chinese are just find unbelievable. The idea that a, a wealthy British woman would risk her life to try to save a Chinese servant is something that in the, you know, the early 1900s in China is unimaginable to many Chinese. And um, it's a story the Chinese still talk about today. But one of the things I think it illustrates is how Laura Kaduri in many ways becomes the conscience of the Kaduri family. Um, while she's alive, she is encouraging her husband to, to do phil philanthropy. And then after she, uh, after she dies, her memory becomes something that her children, as they grow up and take over the business, always carry with them and has a huge, a huge influence. So I, I think in both cases, we see how these women really were the conscience of these families um, while their husbands and, and brothers and others were off, were off making money. Um, I want to just quickly um, move now um, to the 1920s and 1930s and uh, Victor Sassoon, my, my favorite uh, person in this book. And, and uh, the book has been optioned for a movie. I'm not sure if it's ever going to happen, but if it does, I guarantee you Victor Sassoon will be at the center of it. Um, Victor Sassoon uh, had grown up in London. Um, he was part of the Sassoon family that had been sent to London and told to buy country houses and, and send your children to uh, uh, good public schools and to university um, and to spend money. And Victor Sassoon certainly did. He went to Cambridge University. Even as a college student, he was known as a playboy. He was known for having the best wine cellar. Uh, in London. He was always seen with a chorus girl uh, on each arm. 
Um, but during World War I, uh, he's a pilot and his plane crashes during World War I uh, and Victor is, uh, is severely injured. He loses the use of his legs. He's on crutches and a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And he falls into a depression. Um, he basically believes that the kind of playboy life he was looking forward to isn't gonna be possible for him in Europe because he's now crippled. Um, so he decides to go to Shanghai um, and India to see if he can make his fortune there. And um, he does turn out to be a brilliant businessman. He basically relocates the entire Sassoon fortune to Shanghai and he embarks on a building spree. He builds the Peace Hotel, uh, the Cafe Hotel at the time, which is the hotel that I go into um, uh, to try to find the bathroom uh, many decades later. Um, he invests in real estate. Um, he builds a beer factory. Um, but he's not only a great real estate entrepreneur and businessman, he really knows how to have fun. And what Victor Sassoon does is he turns Shanghai into one of the most romantic and exotic places on earth. You know, right now, as the pandemic ends, we're all planning our trips and where we want to go and the travel we want to catch up on. And if this were 1920s or 1930s, we'd all be going to Shanghai. Um, Charlie Chaplin uh, boards a, a ship um, and goes to Shanghai so he can meet Victor Sassoon and stay in his hotel. Uh, Noel Coward writes Private Lives uh, in a suite at the Cafe Hotel. Um, Wallace Simpson, who will go on to uh, make the King of England leave his throne, is uh, photographed in Shanghai uh, naked except for a life jacket which gives you a feel for what Shanghai was like. It was, it was exotic. Um, it was also a little bit, a little bit naughty. And uh, Victor Sassoon presided over this burgeoning uh, kind of social whirlwind uh, that involved foreigners and wealthy Chinese. He would have these extravagant costume parties where he would dress up as a ringmaster and all the guests had to dress up as circus acts or he would dress up as a schoolmaster and all the people attending had to dress up uh, as, as school children. Um, he, uh, on the top of his hotel, he built a penthouse um, which uh, allowed him to sort of look out the window at this incredible empire in Shanghai that he was building with these breathtaking views of the water and of the city. I got a chance to visit it um, when I was doing my research in Shanghai and I was walking around the, 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 his, the Victor Sassoon suite and I went into the bathroom and I noticed there were two bathtubs there. And so I turned to the Chinese fellow who was taking me around and I said, why are there two bathtubs in the bathroom? And he got sort of embarrassed and he said, well, Victor Sassoon always said he didn't mind sharing his bed, uh, but he didn't like sharing his bath. So that gives you a sense of what it was like to be Victor Sassoon uh, in, uh, in Shanghai in the 1920s um, and 1930s. Um, but starting in the late 1930s, um, different, a different kind of person starts coming to Shanghai on these uh, cruise ships. Um, these are refugee Jews who are fleeing the Nazis. Um, by 1937-38, of course, the Nazis have come to power. Um, they've, uh, uh, they've invaded Austria. And Jews in Berlin and Vienna um, are in a panic, desperate to leave, trying to find some way out. But as we know, <clears throat> every country in the world shuts their doors um, to these Jewish refugees. Um, they won't allow them in, including the US and, and Great Britain. Um, and in fact, the only place where Jews can find refuge is Shanghai. Shanghai at this point was partially controlled by the British, partially controlled by the French, partially by the Americans. The Japanese were moving in. There was essentially no functioning government in Shanghai. And what that meant was that if you made it to Shanghai, um, you were safe, you, you couldn't be turned away. And so word of this begins to circulate um, among Jews, especially in Berlin and Vienna. These are middle-class Jews, most of them, uh, lawyers, doctors, store owners, musicians, and they sell their belongings and they book passage on these cruise ships that are going to Shanghai um, as, a, as a place of, of, that they can use for refuge. 
Now, again, just to imagine that, I mean, these are these are uh, our families who don't speak any Chinese. They may have read something about China and the, the pictures of them arriving in China are so striking. They're crammed onto these cruise ships. They're pulling up into Shanghai and looking at these teeming streets with you know, literally millions of Chinese packed in the streets, people dying in the streets, incredible poverty and starvation. Um, and at this point, the Kaduris and the Sassoons really step up and, and make a huge difference. They're businessmen after all, they're not social workers, they, but they know they're being overwhelmed by, by these Jewish refugees. And so um, uh, Victor Sassoon um, begins employing many of these refugees. He turns many of the buildings he owns um, into dormitories or apartments um, for the refugees. Uh, Ellie Kaduri's children, uh, Horace Kaduri and Lawrence Kaduri, who are in their 20s and 30s, set up a school um, for these refugee children. They hire some of the refugee teachers who are showing up and getting off of these ships and, and they employ them to uh, teach uh, these children because these are young kids and many of them, you know, they need some structure. Otherwise, they're just roaming the streets of Shanghai. And um, as it turns out, many of these refugees um, who survived the war end up becoming quite prominent. Uh, Michael Blumenthal was a child in Shanghai uh, fleeing Berlin. He becomes the US Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, Shaul Eisenberg, who forms the Israel Corporation, becomes one of Israel's billionaires, um, is a child in Shanghai. Peter Max, many, some of you may remember, the artist in the 60s who would uh, 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 do these posters, uh, always says he learned how to paint from his Chinese, the Chinese housekeeper uh, who worked in his house. Um, and thousands of, of these refugees keep on coming. Um, ultimately, uh, 18,000 refugees come. The Germans are putting enormous pressure on the Japanese during this time to deal with what they call the Shanghai Jewish problem. And the Japanese are trying to decide what to do. The Japanese have already invaded China. This is before Pearl Harbor, but they've invaded China. They formed a ring essentially around Shanghai. They haven't invaded Shanghai because they don't wanna provoke war with the Americans or the British. Um, but they're dealing with the Germans, and with the Nazis trying to decide what to do. And Victor Sassoon, and really I think one of the great con games of all time, uh, reaches out to the Japanese um, who were in charge of the Jewish problem. Um, this is a Japanese military man uh, named Colonel Inazuka. He was an anti-Semite. He had written a lot uh, about the dangers of Jewish power. Um, and he meets with Victor Sassoon. And Victor Sassoon was incredibly charming. And he says to Colonel Inazuka, you know, you're welcome at my hotel and my nightclubs. Your officers should come and, and eat and drink with me. And you know, I'm a very wealthy man. Maybe I'll invest in some of your uh, companies in Tokyo or in Manchuria where you're, uh, where you're setting up factories. And he so charms in Izuka that the Japanese allow these refugees to keep on coming. At one point, Victor Sassoon even flies to South America to see if he can buy land there where these refugees might be, um, might be, uh, might be settled. Um, ultimately, the Japanese realize um, that they're being conned by Victor Sassoon. It turns out he's spying on them. He's having uh, a lot of the waiters who work in his restaurants and nightclubs uh, spy on the Japanese and sending that information <clears throat> back, to the, back to the British Secret Service. Um, and so Victor Sassoon flees Shanghai um, just before he's arrested um, by the Japanese. Um, the Kaduris are not so lucky. Um, they stay on uh, too long, um, and then they're arrested in Hong Kong and in China right after Pearl Harbor um, and, uh, and are put in prison camps. And ultimately, Eli Kaduri will die in Japanese captivity. But with the Japanese now formally occupying Shanghai, the Nazis turn up the pressure. And uh, members of the Gestapo, who have been involved in um, the war in Poland, uh, fly to Shanghai and they meet with the Japanese and they say, look, the way you deal with your, your Jewish problem is Rosh Hashanah is coming up. The Jews will all be in their synagogues. Uh, you can go there, round them out, round them up, round up the women and children in their homes, take them down to the waterfront, put them on barges, set the barges out into the middle of the river and sink them, and that will solve your Jewish problem. 
Now, the Japanese are appalled by this in part, I think, because they still believe somehow that what Victor Sassoon told them about his influence and the influence of Jews um, is still true. You know, Victor Sassoon kept on saying that he would talk to Winston Churchill because he knew Winston Churchill and try to keep Britain out of the war, that he would talk to his Hollywood friends like Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford to talk to Roosevelt to keep the U.S. out of the war. And so for whatever combination of reasons, the Japanese uh, do not try to kill the Jews. And in fact, of the 18,000 Jewish refugees who go to Shanghai, none of them are killed. Um, it's one of the miracles of World War II. Um, and um, the, the role that the Sassoons and the Kaduris played in this, I think, is something that you know, has never fully been, fully been appreciated. Um, the war ends, and after the war, uh, both the Kaduris and the Sassoons are convinced that things will return to normal in Shanghai, that the parties will resume, that they'll be able to make a lot of money once again. But of course, as we know, that's not what happens. Um, in the end, uh, the communists conquer Shanghai. Um, Victor Sassoon flees the country. He gets a round trip ticket, um, but he never returns. Um, he ends up losing almost all of his fortune because his money was mostly in real estate in Shanghai, the hotels, the factories, these buildings that line the waterfront. Um, he ends up living in the Bahamas and becomes quite bitter about China. And in fact, he sounds a little bit like a, a spurned lover. Um, he says at one point, I didn't leave China, China left me. Um, the Kaduris, in a way are smarter um, and make a series of very different decisions. Um, they had already begin, begun moving some of their money out of Shanghai to Hong Kong, which was a British colony, um, even in the 1930s. And so when they're forced to leave Shanghai and their great mansion there, which becomes the children's palace, um, they go to Hong Kong and begin rebuilding their fortune. And um, one of the lessons they take um, from their time in, in China is that their father, Ellie, might have been a brilliant businessman, but he lived in a bubble and that he never saw the communists coming. He never saw that there would be a revolution. And as a result, the family lost hundreds of millions of dollars in Shanghai um, when the communists took over. And so they decide, his, the children um, who are now in their 40s, who are taking over the Kaduri uh, business empire, that they will pay more attention to Chinese politics. And so they remain in Hong Kong and for the next 50 years are uh, incredibly influential in terms of rebuilding Hong Kong. They always keep lines of communication open to the communists in China. And in 1978, when China opens up again, one of the first calls um, that Beijing makes um, is to the Kaduri family to invite them back and to invest uh, in China, which the Kaduris do. Uh, and today the Kaduris are the wealthiest Western family in China. They're worth more than $13 billion. Um, they have a nuclear power plant they've built for the Chinese. Uh, the Peninsula Hotel chain, which they own, has opened up hotels in Beijing and Shanghai. Um, the Kaduris meet regularly with Xi Jinping, the president of China, um, and with other Chinese leaders. Um, like many Westerners now, they're very nervous about what's happening in Hong Kong with the crackdown. And I think in the back of their minds, there's still this fear perhaps that what happened in Shanghai when they almost lost everything might happen to them um, in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong again. Um, one of the things that's interesting, I think about the legacies of these two families um, is that there is virtually no anti-Semitism in China. China is one of the few places you can go as a Jew. And when you say you're Jewish, you don't have any of those uncomfortable conversations or criticism of Israel or, or things like that. And I, I think some of that is, you know, is, is due to this Chinese fascination with Jews. Um, the, the Chinese are always saying that, you know, the Jews have the same family values and they value education um, much the same way that, that the Chinese do. Um, but there is also the legacy that these families have, have left there. Anybody who goes to Shanghai or Hong Kong sees how different they are um, from the rest of China. Um, these are international cities, very cosmopolitan cities. And a lot of that I think is because of the influence of these global families that not only did very well, but also 
because of the Chinese partners they had and the, the work they did with the Chinese government helped globalize China. Um, and so I, I think that the, the lack of anti-Semitism and also the close ties with Israel. Um, Israel and China have very close ties. Um, you know, Prime Minister Netanyahu, when he would visit, would always go uh, to Shanghai and, and to the, the neighborhood where the Jews were kept. Um, and so I, I think there's been a legacy both for China, but also for Israel, um, and also for Jews worldwide, um, about these families who not only became an important part of Jewish history, but of Chinese history and world history as well. So I think I'll stop there and then turn it back to uh, Duran. Um, for any questions folks may have. Thank you very much. Uh, there are many, many compliments in the chat room. I will absolutely send you the transcripts. You can read them yourself. Um, the first question would be by Benjamin. Uh, he's asking, would I be getting it right in thinking Vidal Sassoon comes into this summer? Uh, no, he doesn't, as a matter of fact. That was one of the questions that I had to at the beginning, but that's a, they were from Spain. They, they were never from, uh, never from Baghdad. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah asked, uh, what was the Sassoon's relationship to the Jewish tradition and observance? Now, that's a great question. And, and the question of Zionism is also very interesting. So both families, the Kaduris and the Sassoon's, when they left Baghdad, were quite observant. And even when the Sassoons started um, sending their sons to London, I was able to see a lot of the wills that the, the sons wrote. And you can almost hear them thundering at their children that, you know, <clears throat> you must marry someone Jewish, you must marry someone Jewish from Baghdad. Um, but as we know, um, as these families became more influential, more assimilated into Western society, uh, many of them began to drift away from Judaism. Uh, several of the Sassoons converted. Um, in fact, Siegfried Sassoon, who is a very known, very well-known British poet, didn't even know that he was, um, that he was Jewish until he was, I think, in his early 20s. Um, a, a number of the Sassoons do make their way eventually to Jerusalem. Um, I interviewed them there. And so there is kind of a religious uh, part of the family, but for the Kaduris and for the, uh, uh, in Hong Kong, and for the Sassoons in London, I, I would describe them mostly as what Americans would call reform Jews. Um, you know, they're liberal Jews. Um, the, um, they go to synagogue for the high holidays and so forth, um, but it's become more cultural. The, the Zionism is interesting. The Sassoons really never became committed Zionists. In fact, um, I mean, I think that Victor Sassoon certainly was far more likely to build a synagogue than to ever set foot in one. He very much wanted to become part of the British aristocracy and all the Sassoons were knighted um, and became uh, you know, involved in the British government and so forth. The Kaduris were different. The Kaduris wanted desperately to get British, and, British citizenship and approval, and they had a very hard time. Eli Kaduri, when he was in Hong Kong um, in the early, in the 1900s, 1910, 1920, kept on applying for British citizenship, and he kept on being turned down. <clears throat> and I found a document that one of the British consuls wrote at one point where he said, you know, if we give Kaduri citizenship, we'll have to give it to all of them you know, suggesting all these immigrant Jews might want citizenship. I think Laura Kaduri, who understood the way Britain worked, um, explained to Ellie that the way to get citizenship was by supporting the charities um, of the royal family. And so once uh, Ellie Kaduri starts giving money to a lot of British charities that are under the sponsorship of, of the British royal family, he gets citizenship and he's knighted. Um, and his son, uh, Lawrence Kaduri, ends up becoming in the House of Lords. Um, but, um, but they have a, a, a much stronger uh, tie um, uh, to Zionism. And in fact, one reason why the Kaduris are thought highly of in China is that Eli Kaduri, the patriarch, when the Balfour Declaration was, um, was uh, issued, uh, Eli Kaduri went to Sun Yat-sen, who was the founder of modern China, sort of a George Washington um, or Ben Gurion of, of China, and asked him to endorse the Balfour Declaration. And Sun Yat-sen writes this extraordinary letter where he says, your people like my people 
are without a home. You are searching for a home. We have people colonizing our home, so it's no longer ours. And I wish you the best of luck in finding your home in the hope that we will one day reclaim ours. And I think that's an early sign how even at a political level, um, there was these families were influential in shaping how China viewed Jews and, and later viewed Israel. Thank you very much. Um, there are all kinds of questions regarding uh, the Jews in China currently. Do you have any statistics about that? Yeah, well, so, you know, you have to understand that the Jewish refugees um, who went to China didn't want to go there. It was just the only place that would accept them. And so after the war, um, they all leave. Um, they make their way to Australia, to Palestine, um, to the United States. Um, one of the most heartbreaking things that happens is that these refugees were sort of cut off in Shanghai. They didn't know what was going on in Europe during World War II. And so when the Americans liberate Shanghai, they begin to put up in, in all the windows of stores and on the walls, lists of all the towns that have been wiped out in Poland and Germany and elsewhere across, um, across Europe, um, as well as in Vienna and Berlin. And the, the Jews in Shanghai suddenly realize that there is no home to go back to. And so they instead make their way to, uh, to Palestine, the US, um, Australia. Um, when the communists take over, the final Jews leave. There are a handful of Jews who stay because they've become you know, enamored of communism or fellow travelers. But today, um, all you have left, um, all you have really in, um, in China are expatriates, right? Israeli businessmen, American businessmen. But that's really separate um, from the Jews who were there during the war. Um, or these families. Um, there is a Jewish community in Hong Kong, which is again, mostly expatriates. Um, and the Kaduris are the leaders of that community and they've given a lot of money to it. Um, but again, um, there, are, there are no more Chinese, uh, there are no Chinese Jews. Um, it's mostly, it's almost all expatriates who are doing business there. Thank you very much. Uh, Rivka asks, are there any records of the names of the young men who were sent from Baghdad to China? Um, there are. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. You know, one of the things that's interesting about doing the research for this book is that China has really begun to close up. Um, in the past few years. It's become much more nationalistic and they're coming much more you know, um, reticent about the kind of information that they'll release. Um, certainly there are pretty good records um, of the refugee Jews. Um, there's a wonderful museum actually about the refugee period, um, which has um, very, good, um, very good records. As far as the early days and so forth, there are some, you know, some uh, early books that were written um, and there may be some information there. Um, I know the um, uh, library um, at the uh, university in Jerusalem also has been given a, a trove of, um, of Sassoon documents. So that may be a place that you can check out. Thank you. Uh, Barbara asked, where did you find Laura Kaduri's diary? Well, it was fascinating. Um, her gra her uh, grandson, I'm sorry, her, her grandson, uh, Ellie, Kud uh, sorry, uh, Michael Kaduri, who's the head of the family now, gave it to me. Um, the Kaduris had never really been written about. And, um, you know, all of us, when we keep our family papers and our photographs, they're probably in a jumble in a big box, you know, in a storeroom somewhere. But when you're worth $13 billion like the Kaduris, they have an archive with an archivist. And in the course of going through all their papers and they save virtually everything, uh, they found this diary. And so he was able to share it with me. I have to say one of the interesting things about doing the research for this book is that it, you know, it took me around the world because these are global families. Um, I was in Jerusalem, in London, in Shanghai, in Hong Kong. At one point I was in Dallas, Texas. And Victor Sassoon, when he left China, uh, settled in the Bahamas. And as I said, he sort of turned his back on China. He ended up marrying his nurse at 65. Um, he married his nurse who was an American from Texas. And so when Victor Sassoon died in the 50s, um, his papers were given to Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. So I went down there and I was going through essentially Victor's business diaries where he kept 
you know, copies of correspondence. And I met with this businessman today and I met with this Chinese official. And as I'm leafing through these uh, pages, pictures of nude women, photographs started dropping out. And I was sort of embarrassed. I thought, oh my God, the librarian's gonna come along and say, what are you doing bringing these you know, naked pictures into the library? Well, it turned out that the way Victor Sassoon, who was a playboy, met women was that he would go down to the ships in the 30s and the late 20s with these celebrities and wealthy uh, women who were coming to Shanghai. And he would offer to take their photo uh, he said he was an amateur photographer and he would bring them back to his studio and take their photo and, you know, have them take off their clothes and then have affairs with them. And, and he kept, you know, he kept these photos. So one of the things that was interesting about the photos is that there were Chinese women, Western women and Indian women um, uh, in these photos, which suggested that, you know, the Sassoon's or Victor certainly was breaking kind of social barriers as well, if, if not maybe, you know, um, in the most savory way, but was certainly willing to have affairs with kind of a wide range of people. And it gave me a real feel for what, what Victor Sassoon's life was like. So you never quite know where research is gonna take you. Thank you very much. Um, David asked, are there any movies or documentaries about these families, like a TV miniseries? Well, there is. I mean, you know, the, the book's been optioned. So, you know, that could happen down the road. I mean, these things are complicated. There is a very good um, uh, PBS documentary, public broadcasting service in the States, um, which is called Harbor from the Holocaust. And it's actually made by a Chinese filmmaker who went back and sort of tried to tell the story from the Chinese point of view of all these refugees coming to Shanghai. And I'm sure if you go on the web and search for Harbor from the Holocaust, uh, you can find it. And what's fascinating is she tracked down some Chinese families who remembered these Jews showing up. And one of the things that's so moving, both in the documentary, but also that I found in, in researching this book, is that, you know, of course, the Jews who were coming from Berlin and Vienna were fleeing for their lives. Very often their neighbors had turned against them. I mean, everyone had turned against them. And when they got to Shanghai, one of the things they say over and over again, and that they talk about is how nice ordinary Chinese are to them. That even though they didn't speak German or English, and the refugees certainly didn't speak Chinese, the, their neighbors, their Chinese neighbors would, you know, give their kids rickshaw rides, or they would teach them how to cook, or they would, you know, help them navigate this kind of strange new city they were in. And so I think on a personal level, um, there was a way in which um, these refugees who were in desperate straits, and the Chinese who were being occupied by the Japanese, found a human connection with, with each other. Um, and, and I think that's a very kind of important human story to remember. Thank you. Uh, Linda asked, is the lack of anti-Semitism at all because the Chinese aren't Christian and they weren't influenced by the church? You know, that may be true. You know, that may be true. I, I think obviously there's a, a lot of thought that's gone into what produced the sort of anti-Semitism um, that, that we saw in Europe and that we see in many other places. Um, but but I, I think there's an element of truth to that. And I think that the Chinese, their encounters with Jews, you know, have been, I mean, it's interesting to me, the first time I went to China, I met an older Chinese man. And um, he was actually in charge of kind of being the janitor in one of the old synagogues that Victor Sassoon had built, but had fallen into disuse. And so his job was to kind of lock the door and sweep up every now and then. And so I was talking to him and I had just come from Eastern Europe where, you know, I'd been to Poland and had heard, you know, knew all the, the horrors of the Holocaust. And so, I said to him, I said, you know, did you remember, I asked this Chinese man, did you remember the Kaduris and the Sassoons? And he said, oh yes, Sassoons, a very rich, very wealthy family. And, and it turned out he had been a Shabbos Goy. He had been someone who had um, turned on lights and started stoves for some of the refugees um, who, were in, um, who were in Shanghai back in the, in the 40s. And so I said to him, I said, well, did you ever feel anger towards them because they were Jewish? And he thought about it for a while and then he answered, he said, no, 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 we hated them because they were rich capitalists, but not because they were Jewish. 
Um, and so I, I thought that was an interesting uh, distinction he made and, and, and may explain why once China became capitalist and, and thought making money was good, Jews suddenly became kind of much more interesting to the Chinese. Thank you very, very much. I will now uh, turn the microphones on so that... Uh... Oh, and let me just make two quick points though before you yes, go sir, to that. Sorry. I see in the chat, people are saying, where can they get the book? Well, the book will be published in Israel in Hebrew by Matar Publishing House. That'll probably be next year. Um, but of course you can buy it um, in English now, um, either through Amazon or, or through any kind of online bookseller. Um, it's available there, but it'll be coming out in Hebrew um, uh, next year. And also one story I, I do wanna share before we uh, turn it uh, uh, to the open mic uh, section. Um, so the Kaduris, as I mentioned, went to Hong Kong after Shanghai and they felt that their father had kind of not understood China and in the end they had lost you know, much of their fortune because of that. Um, but they also developed, and I think this was their mother's influence, um, a great sympathy for what was going on in China um, uh, in the 40s. And so when the communists take over China, hundreds of thousands of refugees, Chinese refugees, begin to pour into Hong Kong. They're trying to escape communism. They're terrified of the communists. And so these refugees show up in Hong Kong and the Kaduris decide to help them. And the way they decide to help them is by setting up almost a micro loan program where they give farmers, Chinese farmers, enough money to say buy um, a, a few farm animals, some farm implements, irrigation, a small plot of land. And then they're able to start growing um, uh, produce or raising farm animals to sell to start kind of getting themselves going in a new life in Hong Kong. Um, and the Kaduris end up helping 300,000 refugees this way. If you go to Hong Kong, there, you know, entire parts of Hong Kong are turned over to these kind of small plots of land that the Kaduris um, uh, enable these Chinese farmers to farm. And one of the things the Kaduris do is they invest a lot of money in pig research. Pork, as we know, is a mainstay of the Chinese diet. And as Hong Kong's population is increasing, they need more pork. And so the, the Kaduris um, fund a lot of research and produce these kind of new uh, pigs that are bigger and, and, and produce more meat. And when I would meet Chinese farmers who had benefited from this, they would say, and this is something a lot of Chinese say in Hong Kong today, they would say, oh yes, the Kaduris, they know everything about pig except what it tastes like. So, you know, there was an example of kind of, you know, these two cultures coming together in a way that, you know, that the Chinese really, really, uh, really remember. So, um, but yes, yeah, so Doran, you can open things up if you'd like. Thank you so, so much, Mr. Jonathan Kaufman. That was uh, riveting. And there are many, many compliments. As I said, I'll send you the transcript. Uh, thank you so much for being here. All of you from all over the world. Wonderful to see such a wonderful audience. Thank you again, Mr. Kaufman. Uh, Laila Tov from Jerusalem, and I will open the mics now. Are you calling on people? Yes. Yeah, I see Ira, Ira Lieberman, I see. Yeah. Uh, just two, two comments. Uh, I have a, a very close friend, David Sassoon. I, I sent him a note to get on this broadcast, so I don't know if he is, but he, he is originally from, um, uh, from Iraq. Uh, his his family, his mother and father were distant cousins from Aleppo. And uh, he had an Iranian passport and he, we met in Brussels, but he grew up in Japan. And he said that his, his family's wealth was concentrated in Japan. He had an uncle named David Sassoon. He was David Sassoon. He had another uncle named David Sassoon who uh, had owned, he said, the most as a private citizen, the most uh, Tokyo real estate of anyone. And my friend ran a big, developed a big trading group over time uh, in metals and uh, did this out of uh, Belgium and Switzerland and did, did very well. His family is now partially in Israel and Italy. So you can see they, they've been very uh, continental. And, and, um, and then I had a, a friend who grew up in um, uh, who grew up in Shanghai and he talked about the abject poverty uh, they had when they were there uh, 
And I mentioned another friend of mine who family who was bar mitzvahed in uh, Shanghai. And he said, oh, I'm yeah, sorry, but, our, our time is a little short. Do you have a question? I, I apologize. I'm sorry. The, I'll just finish this now. And he said, oh, yeah, the, the, the Tuchins, they used to buy us uh, new shoes every year. So this was quite an experience for a very diverse set. Yeah, I mean, I think what, you no, know, thanks for that. I think one of the things that's so interesting is whenever I met Jews from Baghdad um, and the, the descendants of the family or, or others, they always said that the Baghdadi Jews, they insisted with the aristocracy of the Jewish community. They, they would always say, we're the best business people. We're the, you know, we're the most learned people. I, I think the Baghdadi Jews feel that somehow you know, history hasn't treated them, maybe in Israel it's different, but I think they were very insistent on saying that, that the Baghdadi Jews are at the top of the pyramid when it comes to uh, certainly business success. Thank you very much. Sandy Starkman, do you have a question? I just have a comment. I read your book. It's outstanding. I've been to Shanghai and Mumbai. And one of the things you mentioned in your book about the Kaduris is how um, their um, property was expropriated. When we visited the Kaduri house, the marble hall, et cetera, the Chinese guide said, oh, and the Kaduri so graciously gave this home and gardens to the people of China. No. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny that I was meeting with James Sassoon, who's the leader of the Sassoon family now, Lord James Sassoon, and in London. And he was a member of the British government, the Cameron government. He was like economics minister. And he told me this wonderful story. He went to Shanghai, to Beijing, on a, uh, you know, a, a, an official visit from the British government to meet with the finance minister, his counterpart in Beijing. And so the finance minister, uh, who's Chinese, says in Chinese, it's all being translated. He said, I want to welcome you, Lord Sassoon. We know all about your family. They're very well known here in China. And uh, James Sassoon, who's a bit, you know, has a sense of humor, says, well, you know, Mr. Minister, um, if China had decided to give back our property, we would be even wealthier than we are today. And so the Chinese finance minister breaks into English, leans over and says, let's let bygones be bygones. And so I think there is that sense of, you know, the Chinese now have everything. So they're not, they're not eager to get into it. looking for that. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Shalvo Vell, you have a question? Your, your microphone is still muted. I'm proof that you can get this wonderful book in Jerusalem. <laughs> I'm actually um, researching the Sassoons, the financial history of the Sassoons at Cambridge University, um, but focusing on India. And um, I wanted to ask you about your take about Victor Sassoon. You do portray him um, as a playboy and um, slightly superficial. On the other hand, you write and you say that he was an astute businessman. Um, but from the Indian perspective, he's the one who is responsible for the end of the Sassoon dynasty in India, and he lost billions. So it doesn't right. come out, you clearly admire him in the sense that he was uh, dealing in real estate and knew how to run businesses. And yet he's, he just withered away all this money and in the end gave it to his nurse in Dallas, Texas, the rest of it. Right. Well, I think, I think his decision to move to Shanghai is clearly pivotal. What's happening is, so Victor starts out in India and um, he becomes, a, he, he's involved in Indian politics. He, he's keeping a close eye on Gandhi. And essentially, and there's a series of letters about this in the British Museum that I saw. And Victor makes a judgment that um, two things are happening in India. He thinks the Indian middle class is going to oppose British rule he thinks Gandhi could win, and he thinks socialism will come to India. So that's really what fuels his decision to move everything to Shanghai, because when he goes to Shanghai, the nationalist Chinese who are uh, in charge of Shanghai at that point are putting a real selling job on him and saying, you know, we'll work with you and so forth. And so I think that Victor basically decides that China is a better bet than India which at the time, you know, you could sort of say that was, that seemed like the right choice, right? He, he got out of India and then he went to China. 
But what he couldn't foresee or didn't want to see was the rise of communism. He was actually very attuned in India to the rise of socialism and, and the middle class. But somehow when he got to China, you know, one of his affairs is with a, a, a Jewish writer, Emily Hahn, a very well-known writer for the New Yorker magazine. And while she's having an affair with Victor, she's also having an affair with a Chinese left-wing poet and meeting a lot of kind of communists, maybe even Zhou Enlai in Shanghai at that point. And at one point she, she's having lunch with Victor um, at the hotel and she says to him, you know, Victor, you're underestimating these communists, they could really win. And he just dismisses, dismisses. Uh, and I think part of that is, you know, when you're an imperialist, when you're a colonialist, I mean, what's so striking to me is these families lived in China for you know, 175 years, many you know, generations, many relatives, no one ever bothered to learn Chinese. And so as a result, their view of China was kind of always at a distance. And so I think what happened to Victor is that he made the right decision or at least an understandable decision uh, in leaving India. But uh, the Kaduris benefited enormously because Victor, when he left, it was almost like a fire sale in Hong Kong. And one of the people who worked for Victor, uh, his father worked for Victor Sassoon. And his father used to say, Victor Sassoon keeps making the wrong decision at the wrong time over and over again. That had Victor stayed in Hong Kong, he might've ended up like the Kaduris. Um, so again, you know, they were good businessmen, but sometimes they misread the politics of the situation. Thank you very much. Barbara Rosen, you have a question? If you'll allow me, I have a, just want to share a really touching story. I want to thank you very much for this. This has been really interesting. And to tell you that my book club in Orange County is going to be reading your book next month. So I'm looking forward to that. But I, just, I did want to share um, a really touching thing that happened. My husband and I um, were in Shanghai several years ago and um, had a, an Israeli guide who spoke fluent Chinese. Um, and you may be familiar with who he is, Jonathan. I don't recall his name. But we were touring the Shanghai area in this very, very narrow alleyway, um, multi-story buildings on both sides and a narrow alleyway. And this very old woman came to a door and opened her door and she asked her guide what people were doing there. And he explained to her in Chinese that we were Americans who were touring and were interested in knowing about the history of the Jews in Shanghai. And she got this on her face that was just like stark, just surprised. And she pointed up, up to the building across the street and she said, my best friend lived there. Right, wow. right. That just Thank really you. got to me. Yeah, no, no, no. There's, there's that, human, that human connection, which is really very powerful. Thank you very much. Uh, Miriam Kadush, you had a question? Miriam Kadosh, Kadosh. You're on mute. I have a question. I might ask it. Yes, thank you. Uh, what did the Sassoon family have to do with the Sassoon Bank? and the Hong Kong bank, the HSBC. How did that come into play? Well, so uh, the Sassoons were one of the founders of the uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, uh, in part because, as I said, much of their innovations in business was about speed, right? Get steamships, that's a faster way to bring the opium to China. Use the telegraph, it's a faster way to communicate. And when it came to finance, they didn't wanna to have to rely on banks in London uh, to get loans and access to capital. So the Sassoons were uh, deeply involved in starting the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. Um, and in fact, there was a, um, a seat on the board that was known as the Sassoon seat, um, which was there until 1956, when uh, the Sassoon, because the Sassoons were no longer active in China, was given to the Kaduris. Um, and the Kaduris, uh, the Kaduris did it. Um, two things that are interesting is that in 1967, uh, the Hong Kong Bank actually threw the Kaduris off of the board because they were trying to buy an Arab bank 
and there was uh, concern that the Arabs wouldn't want a prominent Jewish family involved with the bank. And so they, they threw the Kaduris off the board. Um, in a way, the Kaduris got a revenge later because when China was taking over Hong Kong, the Kaduris continued to do their business in Hong Kong and work with the Chinese. The Hong Kong Bank moved its operations to London, and the Chinese were very angry about that and, and felt that it was a sign of no confidence. Um, so HSBC uh, now is a big global bank, but its origins were with the uh, Sassing family. Um, thank you very much. We, yes, we have time for just uh, two more questions. So Miriam and then uh, yes, Monica, thank you. thank you. I was I, I was muted before, so I couldn't speak, sorry about that. I would like to ask a question about uh, Montefiore, Sir Luis Montefiore, Moshe Montefiore. I just want to know if he had uh, any relations with the Sassoons and the Kaduris when he was making, uh, you know, improving his ties, British ties with, uh, with, with India or China. Do we know anything about that? You know, I just, it wasn't something I got into, so I, I just don't have an answer. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Monica? Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I wasn't there at the beginning of the thing. What sparked your interest or motivated you to write this book, which is, by the way, I couldn't put down? And the other thing I wanted to ask is how many descendants from each family are still alive and do they cling to any of the traditions? Well, um, yeah, I did talk at the beginning about my interest, which was really, I kept on stumbling upon these signs of Jewish life in Shanghai and wanted to find out more about it. Um, the Kaduri, you know, it's interesting. When I was thinking about the book, people would ask me, is it a, a book about China? Is it a book about, you know, money? But it's really a book about families. And, yeah. and families are interesting in that um, the Sassoon family, you know, their father uh, held a very close um, uh, tie to all the sons, eight sons, but he sent them around the world. And after the father died, um, they actually split into feuding um, parts. And then, as I say, they drift, some of them drifted away from Judaism and they kind of became more fractured, the Sassoons did. They're still quite prominent in, in Britain, but usually for government or, or the arts. The Kaduris were different. Um, you know, when, when uh, Laura Kaduri died, um, Eli Kaduri insisted that his two boys remain with him. He basically yanked them back from London and made them work for him uh, in Shanghai. And in fact, Lawrence Kaduri, one of his sons said to, you know, has said, you know, I didn't have much of a childhood because his father was so dominant. Um, and I'm not sure if that's the reason or not, but the Kaduris have stayed together. The two brothers were incredibly close. One was in Shanghai, one was in Hong Kong. They worked together, they wrote to each other every day. They had real affection for each other. They worked together in Hong Kong. And now uh, their children uh, who are running the, the dynasty now um, are trying to continue that. So, um, so I, I think there is something about you know, families that, that if you allow children to go off and do their own thing, they're gonna do their own thing. And, and families kind of break apart. Um, but the Kaduris, um, because they were in a way ruled with such an iron hand by their father, um, they have kept that in the family. And, um, and, and even to today are, are still running a family company that's worth, as I say, $13 billion, which is, which is truly extraordinary. Will that last into the next generation? You know, the next generation is now in their 20s. You know, it's, it's hard to know. Thank you so much. Um, do we have time for another question? I'm happy to take one more. Okay, thank you. Um, Sharon Love, you had a question? I, I asked you to unmute okay. now. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, your comment about the refugees during the war and uh, being cut off and not knowing what, hap what was happening in Europe is, is right on the mark. Uh, and some of these people, they had no reason to go back to Europe after the war and no families and so on. And some of them stayed in, in Japan and Hong Kong and so on. And a friend of, of mine, the late uh, uh, Solomon Shimkin, whom I met in Japan first in the 70s, and he, he was bald then, he was bald at the end of the war because he said that when he was finding out what happened to his family, he, he was scratching his head and his hair fell out. 
So, uh, you know, sadly, uh, uh, their lives were saved, but their futures, some of them were, were fairly bleak and they had to, you know, sadly move on. No, and I think that's true. And I think there are a number of refugee associations and, and remembrance groups that have tried to, that have tried to stay in touch. Um, and a number of them have gone back to Shanghai and been able to see the, you know, the houses where they, where they lived. And, and, and again, I think that's part of what, you know, we often, when we talk about Jewish history, you know, we talk about, you know, great rabbis or scholars or about the Holocaust. What's so striking about this story, at least for me, is that it's about people who were kind of, you know, they were very wealthy, but they were living in the world. They're very much like us, right? They, they were, they were living these incredibly fascinating lives or the refugees had their lives taken away from them and then had to make all these moral choices and starting again. I mean, that's where the drama comes from is that these were people almost tossed around by history um, as much as they were trying to make it at the same time. Once again, thank you so, so much. There were a few people who would uh, love to be in touch with you regarding uh, different subjects. If you could put your email or an email that you can be reached at in the chat room, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jonathan Kaufman, for a wonderful presentation. Many, many uh, compliments and many wonderful remarks and touching stories in the chat room. I will absolutely send it to you. Again, Great. thank you all for being here from all over the world. Um, Laila Tov from Jerusalem. Thank you very much.